there is um, a memory I have of um, going to New York City with my dad and my brother in 1964. It was to go to the New York World's Fair, which was in 64 and 65. And we um, went to um, the fair for two days and spent another day in the city as tourists. And as a typical tourist, uh, uh, this 12-year-old boy with a camera around his neck was just completely blown away by the majestic height of the buildings around me. And, and like you can see many tourists today who've never been to New York before, just standing. <laughs> and I, um, I have been uh, to New York many times since then. Not many times, but a you know, good number of times. And I, I resist doing that. Every once in a while, I'll catch myself. Uh, oh, no, no. <laughs> and, um, but uh, it's still, I'm, I'm just blown away by the, the, the hugeness and greatness and how small it makes me feel. Well, if we are so awed at man-made structures, how much more awed should we be when we ponder the greatness of our holy and majestic almighty God? And that's what we're looking at today. We're going to be looking at Isaiah 57, and uh, it'll be uh, verse 15. Now, we'll be looking at some other passages, too. Uh, in a moment, but starting in, in Isaiah 57 and verse 13, and we'll read verse 15. Uh, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Now, this is one of those passages that never ceases to astound me. Uh, it, it takes my breath away uh, it, it does so for two reasons. One is the picture of God as high, exalted, inhabiting eternity and holy challenges my mind with the transcendent reality of God. My mind hits a brick wall trying to comprehend him. And I have to breathlessly confess that I cannot fully understand him, but I have to fall in fear and worship before him, as I am thoroughly vanquished in my intellectual pride. I can't grasp it, and I'm left dumbfounded. The second reason I'm astounded by these two truths the second truth that astounds me actually is that this high and exalted one should take an interest in a ruined sinner like me. Reaching down to pick me up, cleansing me, enabling me to stand in his presence, this challenges my heart to trust him, love him, and receive the grace that he extends to me. Now, it was a little over three years ago, um, I preached a message from Isaiah chapter 6, verses uh, 1 through 8. And uh, Pastor Brian has also preached on that passage. He did so early in his time with us. Um, and uh, it's one of his favorite passages, it's one of mine also. And when I gave that message, I also referenced 
this verse in chapter 57. They have a lot in common. And I'd like to just consider very briefly, uh, uh, you may turn to chapter 6 if you like, but I'm going to read it and, and point out just a few things as we read it, and then we'll go back to our, our text. But I want you to keep these verses in the back of your mind while we consider uh, chapter, chapter 57, verse 15. So in chapter 6, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Do those words sound familiar? It's the same expression we just read in chapter 57. High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So he uses that expression, high and lifted up, three times in his prophecy, this compilation of prophecies by Isaiah. Uh, to describe God. This is the first time. There's another reference uh, in in, uh, chapter 52, and then the reference we're looking at today in chapter 57. Above him stood the seraphim, or burning ones. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And then we have this sublime proclamation of God's holiness. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And then we have Isaiah's response, a perfectly natural, perfectly human response, and an appropriate response. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. Isaiah knew he was a dead man. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then we see God making a move toward Isaiah, who is fully expecting judgment from God because of his and his people's sins. And God makes this move toward him. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. We're going to be looking at our text in chapter 57 in three sections. If if you look in in your version, uh, it's very likely that this is laid out in poetic form with with poetic lines. Uh, There should be six lines. And the first two lines are the first portion that we'll be looking at, the Holy One who speaks. God, the the, 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 the one who is about to speak, is introduced in his majesty and holiness. And then the next two lines are set off in quotation marks. And this is God himself speaking, and it's, the exalted one who stoops. Without diminishing his high position, he also assures those who are humble and contrite of his presence with them. And then the last two poetic lines, the living one who revives. His purpose in taking an interest in the lowly and contrite is to revive them, to reinvigorate and give new life. First, 
the Holy One who speaks. In the first 13 verses of chapter 57, we have one of numerous passages in Isaiah that expose and judge Israel for their idolatry. In their persistent worship of idols and the grossly immoral acts that are done in the guise of worship, they have personally offended their God, the Holy One of Israel which is Isaiah's favorite name for God. He uses that 25 times in this book. The Holy One of Israel. He is offended at their sin. And uh, judgment is imminent. But any who repent and are truly broken hearted over their sins will find their holy God to be a God of mercy. God is about to speak, and Isaiah solemnly introduces the speaker. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. They're about to hear the voice of the great and holy God, whom they have mocked and offended by their practices. And in this introduction, God's transcendent greatness is declared. He is high above all. He is the lofty one, exalted. He is eternal, and he is holy. He first reminds them of his supreme greatness, high and lifted up, or in some versions, the high and lofty one. He is high the highest of the high. As uh, Sean read earlier in Psalm 113, uh, the Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above all, above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks down, far down, on the heavens and the earth. He is higher than all earthly rulers. They receive their authority from him. He is sovereign, the highest authority over the created realm. Now he's not just head and shoulders above others who are known as gods. Uh, but since there are no others in his category, he is incomparable. He cannot be compared with another who is similar but not as high. Who would that be? He is not one God among many, but the only true God. And all that exists, he created and he reigns supreme over all creation. And as such, he, is, he singularly holds the position of infinitely high. Then he goes on and calls him the one who is lifted up. Now, I prefer the translation lofty one because he was not lifted up to that position by another, but he occupies that highest position because of who he is. The self-existent, eternal, almighty God. Now it's true, when we praise him, we use the language, We use the language of exalting him or lifting him up. But that language applies to the place we give him in our minds and hearts. When we exalt him, we elevate him in our thinking to a position higher than all that is dear to us and indeed higher than anything we can imagine. 
Now, there are reflections of this concept of highness in the human realm. The protocol for addressing royalty, a monarch, is to not presume familiarity. If I were to have an audience with Charles III, the king of the British Empire, uh, it would be a serious breach of etiquette for me to address him as Charles, even though we, we have the same name. It would be appropriate to use the formal indirect address, Your Highness, or Your Majesty. To address royalty directly uh, in a familiar way is to make oneself appear an equal. And that's not the case. Using the formal indirect address saying is saying, I am not of the same class. I am not on the same plane. So I address your highness, your majesty, that perception of greatness that separates us and keeps me in my place. So God's highness and his lofty status separate him from all of his creation. And we, as sentient beings, that part of creation capable of knowing and experiencing and communicating with him in his high and lofty being, we are separated by that gap, that gulf. Next, he's introduced as inhabiting eternity. How can our finite minds ever wrap around such a statement? It's trying to empty a tanker truck into a water balloon. Can't be done. He is the eternally dwelling one. He, the, he whose life lasts forever and, and is always the same. As such, he exists outside of time uh, in such a way that he can observe all time in an instant. The word inhabit here carries the idea of continually abiding, remaining. From the, from the ages of eternity past to eternity future, they are filled by him. And no human reason or language can capture that concept. And then the prophet adds, whose name is holy. Now, names in the Bible are often more than mere labels. In particular, the names of God are inseparable from his character. They are fundamental in understanding him as he has revealed himself to his people. Now, my parents gave me the names David Charles. They could have just as easily named me Zerubbabel. I'm relieved they didn't. My adolescent years were hard enough without dealing with the name Zerubbabel. But it would have served the purpose of labeling me just as well as Charles. But when the Bible speaks of God's name, it's not a mere label. It is a revelation of who he is and what he is like. Now God reveals himself as holy and there are two aspects of this. He is entirely separate and independent from the frailty and finiteness of his creation. And theologians call that his majesty holiness. But then also he is entirely separate and independent from the sinfulness and defilement of man. And that is his purity holiness. 
Holiness is the state of being totally separate from what is common or profane, the uncreated totally distinct from what is created, and the pure totally distinct from what is impure. It is an essential attribute of God. It is part of his essence. Without it, he would not be God. Now declaring that his name is holy is declaring that he is totally pure and separate, not subject to the weaknesses and moral failures that mark his fallen creatures. In chapter 6, we saw that his holiness is repeatedly proclaimed by the terrifying creatures called burning ones or seraphim. So the one who is about to speak is high, he is exalted, he is eternal, and he is holy. And like Isaiah's audience who had been exposed in all their rebellion and more morally filthy practices, anyone who hears his voice, and that includes us, will be exposed in all our sins that provoke and offend the Holy Speaker. And when Isaiah first saw him high and lifted up, he knew he was a dead man. And we too must hear his voice and tremble and know that we cannot argue against him. He is to be feared and obeyed. The next portion is the exalted one who stoops. Now we hear him speak. And you might notice quotation marks around the next four lines. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. First, he affirms what Isaiah has said about him. I dwell in the high and holy place. In the New Testament, Paul in 1 Timothy 6.16 gives us a very similar description of God, what might be a sort of a parallel passage to this. He's speaking of God who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. The high and holy place in Isaiah answer to the unapproachable light in 1 Timothy. God in his holiness and glory is unapproachable by sinful man. He told Moses that no one can see my face and live. When the tabernacle was completed, according to all of the precise directions that God gave to Moses, the fierce brilliance of God's glory filled it so that even the consecrated priests could not enter to begin their duties. Now back in chapter 6, when Isaiah was confronted with this same God on his throne, he exclaimed in terror, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we begin to recognize the holiness of God, we begin to see our own filthiness. If we do not recognize our own condition, we likely have not had an accurate grasp of who God is. Others in Scripture have been confronted by the majestic glory of God and through that experience encountered their own defilement and mortality. Job, 
when God spoke to him out of the whirlwind, Job responded, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Ezekiel, when he was given that terrifying vision of God on his throne, supported by the, these mysterious wheels and the four cherubim, uh, transporting him, he says, I, when I saw it, I fell on my face. Peter, when he and the disciples had been fishing all night, had caught nothing, and the Lord on the shore told them to cast the net on the other side of the boat, and they drew in this miraculous catch of fish that was, that was more than they could handle, Peter knew who it was. And he said, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. And even the Apostle John, he said, on the island of Patmos where he was exiled, when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ and all his brilliant glory, he said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now John knew Jesus well. In his earthly ministry, John was one of the closest disciples to him. And even at the Last Supper, John leaned on his breast. He was intimate with Christ. But here he sees him in his glory, and he can't handle it. If the text were to end here, it would leave us with a sense of hopelessness. There could be no recovery for Adam's race and no personal restoration to the fellowship with God that we were originally created to have and enjoy. Only the judgment of a holy God awaits the sinner. But it doesn't end here. And also, with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, do you feel the impact of that? He dwells in the high and holy place, but also with the contrite and the humble. This is the second dwelling place of God. The word contrite means crushed, broken, worn down. It's having a sincere remorse and filled with a sense of guilt and desire for atonement. Lowly or humble means occupying a low place, a humble rank. No human being is capable of advancing one step into the presence of our holy God. But God has come into our presence. God has stooped to our level. We are not left in our hopeless condition where our only prospect is to be consumed in the fires of holy judgment. In Jesus Christ, God the Son has come to save us. The Word has become flesh and dwelt among us. The incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ completed the work of God to accomplish our salvation and restore our fellowship with God. Paul, in that marvelous passage in, in Philippians chapter 2, says, Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews 2.9, 
says, But we see him who was for a little while made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because, or because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. If we have humbled ourselves in placing our complete trust in this one who humbled himself to receive the death that we deserved, we are those among whom he dwells. He is our Emmanuel, our God with us. The final portion is the living one who revives to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. His interest in coming is revival. He pours new life into the sinner who knows their dead and broken state in sin and comes to Jesus for cleansing. This is grace and John Newton was right to label it amazing grace. When the Queen of Sheba witnessed Solomon in all his earthly glory, we read that there was no more spirit in her. A greater than Solomon is here. When we have encountered God in all his lofty heights and blazing holiness, we can only be humbled in spirit. We have the wind knocked out of us and tremble, knowing that we deserve nothing but his righteous judgment. But the grace of God in Jesus Christ revives our spirits. When we have encountered our holy God in our sins, we are crushed, helplessly broken, but the grace of Jesus Christ revives the broken and crushed heart. That unapproachable height of his dwelling place and holiness is a gulf between God and man, but it is a gulf that has been spanned by Jesus Christ. And that beautiful old hymn at Calvary puts it this way. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Well, as Pastor Brian would say, what do we take home from this? These are our conclusions. There are four I'd like you to remember. First of all, our concept of God's greatness or highness can never be too great. Whatever our minds can conceive, he is always greater. He can never be accused of failure or weakness. We can't put him in a box. God's holiness is absolute. He can never be accused of having any moral imperfection. Third, when we hold a proper grasp of God's greatness and holiness, our own sin and imperfections are magnified. Our response should be, godly fear and holy worship. And finally, we should never despair that we are beyond reconciliation with God. Nobody is too great a sinner to be saved. Nobody is too far gone. There is hope for the one who acknowledges their sin and comes to this one who suffered their death for them in their place. 
and cleansed, lifted up, we are made holy. We are brought into his holy presence. What a marvel that is. We should never trivialize that. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our holy God, how can our minds contain such truths? They are always, always greater than we can grasp. And yet, in your grace, you not only open our understanding sufficiently to bring us to yourself, that we see our own sins, that we acknowledge our own defilement, and that we can come to Jesus Christ for cleansing. And cleansed, even elevated to sit in the heavenlies with him. Lord, we thank you for this miracle. We thank you for who you are. And we thank you for your presence with us. Where two or three are gathered together in Jesus' name, he is here in our midst. And we do this today. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving. We give you worship. We give you ourselves. In the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.